The crowd is ideal to hide oneself in, hidden in plain sight. Thus Barabbas stands among the cheering people at the eastern gate of Jerusalem. Today it is Shabbat Haggadol. But why there are so many people out here is a mystery to Barabbas. He has come down attracted by the noise and sees his chance to be among the people again, knowing that the Romans are looking for him. He is Jewish and knows the rules and laws, but it continues to amaze him why it is always so easy to get so many people up and running for the holy feasts, while it is impossible to succeed in unleashing a great uprising in order to drive out the Romans. Ah, the terrible Sanhedrin is in league with the enemy. In exchange for power, they give up their freedom and that of the people. How many bloody attacks and uprisings had he already participated in, with danger to lose his life, and everything without result. And now he had killed a Roman in the presence of witnesses, and he had to hide. Well, at this moment he could at least go among the people. But before the end of the Passover rush, he would leave the area. If the Romans would catch him, they would certainly crucify him. That was the punishment for that violent resistance. Barabbas had never been afraid to die during the uprisings. But to die on the cross? That thought made him shiver. The crowd begins to cheer louder. Barabbas asks some people who were standing next to him what is going on. Jesus, they reply with one word. Barabbas is startled and wraps his cloth over his face. What? Has he been recognized? They say his name, Jesus. He is about to disappear into the crowd and advance his flight. But then he sees the bystanders point to the road. Jesus, our king! Barabbas lets out a sigh of relief. Well, of course, he is not the only one named Jesus. He looks at the road and sees someone approaching on a donkey. What kind of a king is that? He does not even ride a horse. And how so a king? Since when did the Romans or the Sanhedrin allow another leader? But the crowd thinks quite differently about that. And many put their coats on the road and wave with palm branches. At first a bit chaotic, but then more and more in chorus they sing. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord, O Lord, I beseech thee, send now victory. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With branches in hand, join in the festival procession up to the horns of the altar. Barabbas is surprised at this turn. It looks just like the Feast of Tabernacles. What is the meaning of all this? Then, when the man on the donkey approaches, he recognizes him. He once heard him speak, and now remembers that he is also called Jesus. He had spoken wisely, but his words were more like a peaceful resistance against the Jewish establishment. A useless struggle. The real enemy is the Roman occupation, and it certainly cannot be defeated peacefully. Then Jesus, the king, rides just past Barabbas and looks directly at him. It is a penetrating look. Barabbas cannot determine whether it's actually reassuring or alarming. Before he can figure it out, Jesus passes and enters the gate of the city. The people call for salvation and victory. How ironic, Barabbas thinks to himself. Both our names are Jesus, and we are both fighting for liberation. And he, with his peaceful behavior that leads nowhere, is lauded as a hero. And I, who have put my life on the line several times, must hide myself. What is wrong with these people? In the seconds that King Jesus had looked at him, Barabbas had involuntarily lowered the cloth in front of his face, as if he wanted to show him his face. And now he looks at the other side of the road. And right in front of him is a Roman soldier who looks at him strongly. 
Barabbas pulls the cloth over his face again and sees how the soldier lifts his arm and points at him. Before Barabbas can make a move, he feels a hand that grabs him firmly by the shoulder. He turns around. A Roman soldier. It's over. He has been too reckless. Everything is going so fast now. Suddenly there are four soldiers who pull him forcefully along with them. They lead him past the people who are unaware of what's going on. Continue to sing loudly, Anna Yahweh Hosiana. The irony that just before only existed in Barabbas' thoughts has now become tangible. In a matter of minutes they arrive at the Praetorium. By now Barabbas has been beaten and kicked frequently and is already covered with bruises. To the courtroom, a centurion shouts to the soldiers who hold Barabbas. They go into a spacious room and keep him standing there. Several people enter the hall and there is a busy buzz. Barabbas is tormented by one thought. The big nails that will be pierced through his wrists and feet. And then the hours of torture on the cross before it is over. He begins to tremble. Then suddenly there is silence. The governor comes in. Okay, quickly, he says. What is the accusation? Another answers, violent resistance against the government and murder of a Roman citizen on duty by the name of Cornelius Cassianus. Barabbas thinks again of the time he had attacked a Roman camp with a small militia. They had almost succeeded in taking over the camp and stealing the weapons for the next larger attack. It was a good plan. And although they were outnumbered, they were courageous and determined. But the unfortunate fate had it that exactly at that time a regiment came to the camp to relieve the troops there. And suddenly they were strongly in the minority. Ahas was overwhelmed by two soldiers and what could Barabbas have done? They had to withdraw, but he could not leave his brother in arms. With one blow of his sword he killed one of the soldiers. The other one looked at him while he tried to keep hold of Ahas with difficulty. Barabbas swung again, but the soldier let go of Ahas and took off. And then they fled. They had lost not anyone. But the mission had failed, and the soldier, as well as some others, had recognized him. Barabbas was a striking appearance with his large stature, dark beard and wild hair. Now that he had heard the name of the soldier whom he had killed, it filled him with a strange feeling. Cornelius. He probably had parents and maybe brothers and sisters. Cornelius Cassianus. At least he had a family name. He had known his fa who his father was. That was very different from Barabbas. His name carried shame with it. Bar Abbas. Son of the father. But which father? No one who knew. It was an empty name that carried the shame of his mother with it. Barabbas' thoughts are disrupted roughly when all of a sudden the same soldier, who at the time was holding Ahas, is standing before him again. The soldier looks at him trium triumphantly and says with a loud voice, It is he! Pilate, the governor, looks at Barabbas and then says, Turn around! Barabbas obeys and looks at the small group that has gathered in the hall. Behind him, Barabbas hears Pilate's voice again. Who else confirms that he is the one? Three others raise their hands. Pilate responds, OK, clear, look at me. Barabbas turns around again. What is your name? Jesus Barabbas. Pilate now looks aside to a secretary who is busy making notes. Then Pilate says loudly, death by crucifixion. He waits for a few seconds while the secretary writes. Then he continues, the sentence will be executed in four days from now at the Jewish Passover festival. Provide a letter for Cornelius' family. Barabbas now begins to shake uncontrollably and fears, fear takes hold of him. The secretary scribbles the last remarks and then steps up to Pilate with the parchment. They are busy doing something for a while, and then Pilate lands his signet ring with power on the parchment and then says, So it is written, so it will be done. Then he leaves the room, and after him most of the others. 
four soldiers escort Barabbas brutally to a spot a little further. They point him to a hole in the ground, a pit. He then gets a rope in his hands. Hold on! He knows what's coming and holds the rope firmly with two hands. Then he is kicked with brute force into the pit. The pain of the unexpected kick makes him lose his grip on the rope. He responds quickly but cannot prevent the rope from slipping through his hands and burning them. He bounces against the stone wall of the well left and right before he hits the muddy bottom with a hard thud for about 15 feet down. Immediately there is a hard tug on the rope and it is pulled up. For a few moments he is disoriented and he tries to suppress the pain. He curses inside himself as he hears the soldiers talking and laughing while they leave. He touches his head, he bleeds. For a moment he is worried, but then he thinks, what does it matter? It is nothing compared to what he will go through in four days. And then, after that, everything will be over. It is still early. He looks up and sees the circle of light above him. Freedom. He hears the crowd very weakly. Anna, Yahweh, Hosianna, Yahweh, give victory. He would like to enjoy victory. He had often thought about the times of the prophet Moshe, the victories of Yehoshua and King David. How often had he hoped that those times would revive again? Why was Yahweh not favorable to Israel? He knew the answer. The treacherous high priest and the Sanhedrin did not choose Yahweh, but the Romans. Why would Yahweh choose us? And he himself had never wondered what Yahweh wanted. He had taken the right into his own hands and lost it. And that other Jesus, who was now being brought in by the people, he had talked a lot about Yahweh. Perhaps he was right. Perhaps that peaceful approach was an evasive maneuver. Now the people proclaimed him as their king. And who knows, maybe Yahweh will now intervene as he had done against the Egyptians in Moshe's time or against the Canaanites in Yehoshua's time. Had Yahweh not caused the walls of Jericho to collapse? Had not Yahweh given victory to Gideon and his 300? Why had he not thought of these things before? His tactics might have been completely wrong. Anyway, it is too late now. Barabbas' thoughts are driving him crazy, and he still has to spend four days in this moist pit while the hours crawl by as slow as possible. Many fruitless thoughts later, he looks up again. The circle is no longer light, but dark. He stares and sees a star, and then another. Slowly he closes his eyes and falls asleep. His restless spirit leads him to a lively dream world in which he opens his eyes again. Again he sees the circle above him and it becomes lighter and lighter, brighter and brighter, blinding the sun. Then there is a voice, deeper than the light is bright. Abraham, Abraham! Barabbas is Abraham in his dream and he replies, Here I am, Lord. The voice from the bright light continues. Take your only son, whom you love so much, and go to Moriah. There you shall sacrifice him. Barabbas, Abraham, feels the fear again and starts shaking again uncontrollably, but he goes on his way, he must obey. Barabbas now sees Abraham walking through the eastern gate, while the people are cheering, Hosianna, then past the praetorium to the pit in which he sits. He looks up and in the half-dark circle he sees Abram throwing a rope at him and then pulling him out of the pit. Together they continue, towards the temple, to the altar. Barabbas tries to resist but then finds himself on the altar. He is the son, Bar Abbas. Abraham, Abba, is the father. He is sacrificed. He trembles with fear but cannot climb off the altar. Something holds him. His hands and feet are tied to the horns of the altar. The crowd that is standing around it sinks, bind the sacrifice with cords even unto the horns of the altar. Barabbas is blinded by the sunlight, the bright circle. He sees the silhouette of Abram lifting his arm and holding a large dagger in his hand. In his thoughts he shouts, 
Anna Yahweh, Hosiana, Lord, give salvation now. Then the voice from the bright light roars, Abram, Abram, do not touch him. Barabbas now stands between the crowd and sees how a beautiful white lamb walks towards the altar. The lamb stops and looks at him. He knows that look, it is a penetrating look. Barabbas cannot determine whether it is a reassuring or alarming look. Before he has figured it out, the lamb lies on the altar and the blood flows to his feet. Barabbas cries, tears flow down and mix with the blood. He drops to his knees and the moment his knees hit the ground, he wakes up with a shock. He is back in the pit and realizes that he has been dreaming. But his heart beats in his throat and his cheeks are wet with tears and sweat is on his forehead. What is happening? Is it fear of the coming torture and death that plays with him? He tries to get the dream back in his mind and to understand what the meaning is of all this. Slowly the hours pass. The circle above him becomes light and dark and again light. He hears the sound of the many people who have come to Jerusalem for the Passover. Talking, laughter, singing. At least they are free. He had fought for them and they do not even realize it. Eventually the day of the Passover breaks. There is no future anymore. The only thing he tries to think about is the end, when he will finally close his eyes and everything will be over. If only he could skip the torture. He tries it in any case in mind. Then he hears the voices of soldiers. A few faces appear in the light circle. Barabbas, he answers in a soft voice. His throat is dry. Yes. One of the soldiers says, it is time, you have to come with us. They lower a ladder and Barabbas notices how weak he has become and how stiff his muscles are when he climbs up with difficulty. He longs for the end, but knows that it is still a long way. Once he is upstairs, he closes his eyes because of the bright sunlight. And the soldiers pinch their noses shut. Barabbas does not realize it, but he is thinking after having been a few days in the pit. Take off your clothes, the centurion commands. Barabbas obeys without thinking. Before he realizes it, a bucket of water is poured over him, and then another one. His heart skips a beat, but at the same time it is refreshing. The transition from the dark, smelly and damp pit into the bright sunlight and the refreshing water is big and gives him some energy again. The sun is still low, it is still early, but the spring sun already has a lot of power and feels good on his skin. One of the soldiers gives him a garment and he puts it on. Then he is taken to the Praetorium. He hears a large crowd of people screaming, but cannot determine what is going on. They enter through the garden and pass through some galleries. Then they enter the Gabata, the pavement. Pilate is seated in his judgment seat and a large crowd of screaming people have gathered on the terrace. Barabbas sees some of the members of the Sanhedrin stand in between them, unmistakable by their clothing. Barabbas is put in front of the crowd, a few meters away from Pilate. There is already another man standing there with a crown of thorns on his head and wearing a purple robe. That is a royal mantle. Barabbas looks aside. The man looks at him. Barabbas is frightened. It is Jesus, the king. He looks at Barabbas with a penetrating look. It is a reassuring look. Barabbas does not understand what is happening. Are they pulling a sick joke on him? Pilate speaks. Who do you want me to release? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? Barabbas understands that Pilate wants to grant someone pardon because of the feast. And of course, he had chosen this innocent and peaceful Jesus who was loved by the people and was a proclaimed king so that he knew for certain that they would release him. And that he, Barabbas, the murderer of one of his soldiers, would be crucified. The Romans loved theater. But Barabbas could not see the humor. 
Why didn't they just get it over with quickly? Meanwhile, Pilate's wife comes out and whispers something to Pilate. They look at Jesus, the king. The members of the Sanhedrin are also busy talking to the people around them and also pointing to Jesus, the king. Barabbas legs begin to shake involuntarily. Again, he thinks of the torture that awaits him and looks aside at Jesus the King. He looks at him in return. His face is neutral, but his eyes give peace an indescribable calmness. Then Pilate speaks again. Which of the two do you want me to release? With amazement, Barabbas hears that the crowd begins to shout softly and then increasingly louder. Barabbas, Barabbas, had they misunderstood, had he misunderstood, Pilate had asked who to release, not who to crucify. Pilate answers, what shall I do then with Jesus, called the Messiah? Let him be crucified. Barabbas does not understand what is going on. A few days ago, these same people sang, Jesus, our King, Hosianna. Once again, Pilate speaks up. What wrong has he done? The only answer that follows is, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate looks at his wife with incomprehension and then orders one of his men to bring water. A little while later, the servant comes back with a bowl of water. Pilate raises his hand and the crowd quiets. Then he dips both hands in the water and says, I am innocent of the death of this man. See to it yourself. Then he turns to Barabbas and says, you are free to go. Barabbas cannot believe what is happening, but the soldiers push him into the crowd. He is free. He is free. He turns and looks at Jesus, the king, and he looks at him. His look is reassuring. Barabbas now thinks of his dream, of the lifted knife in Abraham's hand, of the beautiful white lamb, of the blood that flowed up to his feet. Then he becomes overwhelmed by emotions and begins to cry. He quickly covers his face with his cloak and disappears among the people. For hours Barabbas walks around. Some of his militia members had already greeted him. They too expected to witness the execution of their fellow freedom fighter today and were pleasantly surprised. They had given him bread and wine. But now Barabbas is walking alone again, outside the city. He has too much to think about. His emotions play with him and he does not want others to see him like that. He walks near the outer city. A little further is Kogolta, the execution site. There is a large group present and he also walks over there. The soldiers are just busy nailing the criminals to the cross. Barabbas shivers when he hears the cries of the men. He should have been one of them. He had deserved it. He had robbed a family of their son. With what right? And now that innocent king of the Jews was being crucified. And what had they done to him? Barabbas could barely recognize him, so heavily he had been battered. They had almost flogged him to death. Barabbas saw his body cramp while the nails were hit through his flesh. But no sound came out of his mouth. The only cries came from a few women. His mother must be among them. But where is his father? Barabbas searches among the people but cannot discover who the father of this Jesus is. Is he perhaps like him, Barabbas, son of the father, an unknown? He remembered his dream, how the voice out of the bright light had said, Take your only son, whom you love so much, and go to Moriah. There you shall sacrifice him. But this time no one intervened. Barabbas keeps watching the whole event from some distance. Three crosses are being erected, and that innocent man hangs there between the two criminals, instead of him. Suddenly it gets dark. How is that possible? It is the middle of the day. Barabbas looks up. The normally bright circle of the sun has gone dark. He thinks again of the circle he saw from the pit how it got dark. Then he sees the bright sun in his mind again, with the silhouette of Abraham, the father, 
with a raised hand and a dagger in it. In this strange twilight in the middle of the day, Barabbas moves closer to the crosses. Until he is close to the soldiers he feared just a few days ago. He was free. The singing of the people on the temple square, not far from there, can be heard. The Passover lamb, Korban Pesach, is now slaughtered and sacrificed. Barabbas can hear the chant. This is the day which the Lord had made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Barabbas looks up and sees that Jesus the King also directs his head towards the temple. He also hears it. Four days ago the same people sang the same psalm while he was hailed in as King. Now Jesus is looking down, right in the eyes of Barabbas. It is a penetrating look. It is a look full of pain. It touches Barabbas down to the core of his soul. Again the tears are rolling over Barabbas' face. He had not cried in years and now it was coming unstoppable again and again. Jesus Barabbas and Jesus the Messiah are looking at each other. The son lost without father and the son of the father. The father with his hand lifted with a dagger in it. In his heart Barabbas understood what was going on. He cried even more uninhibited and whispered through his tears, Forgive me, Lord, forgive me, please forgive me. Jesus now raises his head and cries out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? In a flesh, Barabbas sees the hand with a knife. He thinks again of the voice that had said to Abram, Take your only son, whom you love so much, and go to Moriah. There you shall sacrifice him. Just a bit earlier, he had searched among the people for the father of this Jesus. Now the reality hit him. Eli, Eli, my God, my God. Jesus calls on his father, the father with a knife lifted. He sacrifices his only begotten son here on Moriah. What Barabbas a moment ago understood in his heart, he now begins to understand with his mind. And his lips are muttering instead of me. Again he hears the crowd sing in the distance. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. The Lord is God and he has made his light shine on us. Again Jesus cries out from the cross. Barabbas looks up and sees how Jesus dies. Then the earth shakes and trembles so violently that Barabbas falls to his knees. The rocks rent and everyone on the site is filled with fear. Barabbas hears the soldiers say to each other, He was truly God's son. Barabbas thinks again of the beautiful white lamb that had looked at him before it had taken his place on the altar. He thought of Jesus the Messiah who had looked at him with a reassuring look at the Gabbatha in front of Pilate before he had taken his place on the cross. And again, he cries.